Welcome to the CERTIP webinar series today. Um, we'd like to welcome today Helen Sue Kim from Duke University, and she will be briefing her project ER 1744. That's on bioavailability of mer mercury sulfides and sediments. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Helen to brief her project. Helen? OK, great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so I'm, I'm Helen Shee Kim, a professor of environmental engineering at Duke University. And I'll be presenting a summary of our project uh, for CERTIP, uh, the project that's titled Bioavailability of Mercury Sulfides and Sediments. Our goal here in this project was to develop ways to quantify the bioavailability of mercury, uh, particularly in sediment environments. And what I mean by bioavailability is the availability of mercury for microorganisms that can produce methylmercury, the toxic form of mercury. <clears throat> so uh, let me first give an introduction of uh, the team, and then I'll, I'll go into some of the background for this project. So this project is led by myself. Uh, I'm an environmental geochemist, and I, uh, I specialize in mercury biogeochemistry. And my partner is also Professor Mark Deschus, also at Duke University. His expertise is environmental biotechnology. And we are interested in mercury uh, because mercury is a global pollutant and a known neurotoxin. And it is a contaminant that is responsible for most of the fish consumption advisories uh, in the United States. So on this graph here, I've taken this from the EPA website, where they show the numbers of river miles that are under advisory for fish consumption. And what you can see is that mercury is typically the, is the number one reason why we have fish consumption advisories around the country. Uh, we can see that there's more than a million river miles under advisory, as well as more than 10 million acres of lakes under, under fish advisory because of mercury. Um, the, uh, the presence of mercury in fish is a concern because this presents the major path in which people can be exposed to mercury. Uh, the CDC performed a study about 10, 15 years ago where they looked at the extent of the exposure of mercury to maternal age women and found that about 5 to 10 percent of maternal age women have mercury blood levels that exceed health, health thresholds. And this exposure rate to this population translates to a couple hundred thousand children born every year to high levels of mercury exposure, uh, uh, exposure in utero. So the, um, the, the potential, the implications for public health in terms of mercury exposure are well known. And so as a result of this, mercury is uh, considered to be a contaminant that can often drive risk assessments in various contaminated sediment sites. Uh, one of the there's many challenges in, in dealing with the mercury problem in the environment. Uh, and I've listed them here, a few of them here in, in bullets. Um, there's many sources of mercury to the biosphere, uh, global uh, sources to the atmosphere that in which mercury can travel globally. Uh, this is a metal that can potentially tr travel very long distances, so long meaning uh, across continents or across oceans, um, and this would be through the atmosphere. And this mercury has the um, or mercury has the capability of accumulating in the food web, particularly as an organomercury compound called methylmercury. So methylmercury is the primary form of mercury that you see in, in fish, and it's also the most toxic form uh, to humans. And so one, another final challenge with dealing with this mercury problem is that we need to be able to understand the factors that influence the bioaccumulation of mercury in the food web, as well as to how methylmercury is produced in the environment. So this cartoon here is a, cart, uh, is a figure kind of summarizing all the different pathways that mercury can take uh, between various compartments of the biosphere, including the atmosphere, aquatic ecosystems, and soil and sediment. And there's <clears throat> this diagram is, meant, is actually a quite of a simplification of all the different chemical and biological, biological transformations that mercury can take. Uh, in terms of the accumulation of mercury in the food web, one of the key steps in this is actually the production of methylmercury, uh, which occurs primarily by anaerobic microorganisms that are native to most benthic environments, particularly sediments. So typically, or so for this project, what we're very much interested in is understanding what kinds of mercury can be methylated in sediments. So in other words, what's the methylation potential of mercury in sediments? And this is the, this is the crux of our project, is to understand this question. So here I have an outline of the talk that's basically outlined as key questions that we're trying to answer. 
Um, the first question is, we want to know what kinds of mercury persist in contaminated sediments. What are the chemical forms of mercury? And from this, we want to know of that of these different chemical forms, what forms of it are available to these microorganisms that then convert it to methylmercury. And so, for example, on the on the figure on the right, you can imagine that in a sediment environment, you can have many types chemical types of mercury, but only a subset of that mercury, some bioavailable fraction, can be taken up by methylating bacteria that then produce methylmercury, and then it's uh, one of the first steps towards accumulation in the food web. So our project uh, for this CERDIP project uh, was uh, sought to try to answer these first two questions. What forms of mercury persist in, in sediments, and then what, which, what of those species are available to bacteria? The last part of my talk, I'll talk about the implications of what we found for managing contaminated sediments. So let me get first get to, uh, oh, and then the, our research, this specific project, was uh, really very much focused on uh, nanoparticles or nanoscale materials of mercury that will p be part of the pool of mercury in sediments. So our research has focused on nanoparticles in the context of bioavailability. So let me get to the part one. What forms of mercury persist in contaminated sediments? And here is where we have to consider mercury interacting with sulfide and organic matter in sediment settings. So uh, the conventional way in which people or researchers have uh, tried to model the speciation of mercury in sediments is using a chemical equilibrium speciation approach. So here I have a diagram trying to summarize that. Typically, we think of a metal, like mercury, existing in two major fractions, a particulate fraction and a dissolved fraction. In the dissolved fraction, we can further divide this up into various complexes of that metal with, with different types of ligands. And these complexes will be either weakly uh, bound forms, such as mercury chloride species or mercury hydroxide species, or they could be more strongly complex by uh, of, by ligands such as sulfide and dissolved organic matter. And we model the, uh, the speciation of mercury between these different forms using chemical equilibrium approach. So the, that means the formation of each of these complexes can be represented by an equilibrium reaction, and the relative amounts of the formation of these complexes can be estimated through, uh, can be estimated by if we know the equilibrium constants for these reactions. So this is the chemical equilibrium approach for quantifying dissolved mercury speciation. And then we can, we've also used it to sort of figure out the partitioning between particulate and dissolved, where the particulate forms of mercury will include mineral phases of mercury, as well as mercury that might be absorbed to other minerals, such as FES or mechanoate. So this approach, uh, in terms of the conventional approach, has uh, led us to uh, think about, well, only a certain part of this, uh, only a certain part of the fraction of mercury as represented by the particulate and dissolved would be available to organisms. In particular, what the conventional paradigm is, is that, uh, has assumed is that only dissolved species of mercury can be available to microorganisms, and that dissolved species in which we can quantify based off of speciation. So a subset of these dissolved species would be available to these organisms, and we would quantify this using equilibrium chemistry. Right. So this approach uh, is used not just for mercury, but also other metals. But there's a lot of problems with this approach. Um, first of all, it assumes that you can uh, differentiate between particulate and dissolved metal. And then the second problem is that you can differentiate between the species using equilibrium chemistry, which is not always a good assumption. So here's an example of what I mean by uh, the difficulties in differentiating a truly dissolved versus a particulate fraction of mercury. Here I have a graph where we uh, show the uh, concentration of mercury in the pore water of a sediment sample taken from a freshwater lake in, in Connecticut. Um, this lake has, uh, is somewhat elevated in terms of the mercury, total mercury concentration in the sediment, so that's what I have there. And what we did is we took this sediment and separated out the pore water using either filtration or separation by centrifugation. So uh, typically, what uh, is the most common approach is to use a filter, such as a 0.2 micron filter or a 0.45 micron filter, to separate out pore water from sediment 
pour water from sediment particles. And the fraction that falls through this filter is often defined as the dissolved fraction. So if you were to use this method to uh, quantify the nominally dissolved fraction of mercury, you would get this amount uh, as, as what you would consider to be dissolved, so 1,000 nanograms per liter in this sample. Um, you can try to do other methods of separation, for example, centrifugation, which is what we've done here. And what, we, uh, and what we're, I'm showing here is the concentration of mercury in the supernatant of the this, of this sample uh, for three different centrifugation speeds uh, to separate particles from water. And the key thing here is that ultra when you apply ultra-centrifugation, which removes uh, particles that are on the order of five nanometers in diameter or greater, uh, what we see is we recently remove all of the mercury from that water uh, and have uh, basically fall below our detection limits um, for mercury in, in the water. And so the truly dissolved fraction in this case is actually something that's substantially smaller than what we would quanti have quantified by a 0.2 micron filter. So the take home here is that when you're talking about sediment pore water, most of that mercury is actually bound to particles, colloidal particles and bigger particles. And the idea of having nanoparticles, very small particles in continuous sediments, uh, has been shown for many years. Um, and so people have found evidence of nanoscale particles of metal sulfides in various kinds of sediment settings. So for example, nanoscale mercuric sulfides in a fl contaminated floodplain in Tennessee, or other kinds of metal sulfide nanoparticles in which mercury could probably absorb to it. And I want to distinguish between nanoscale materials and regular, uh, and what we conventionally call colloids, because nanoscale materials, uh, which are nanostructured, not necessarily uh, just nano, uh, not necessarily just uh, nanoparticle in size in terms of uh, being less than 100 nanometers, but they're they're, st they're actually nanostructured. What they what that means is that they have a high specific surface area, uh, which lends them, uh, which is also lends to uh, defects on the surface of the particles, uh, as well as lattice defects, and this let, uh, gives the particle reactivity that's different from what you would you would observe for bulk scale materials, non uh, materials that are not nanocrystalline. And how would these nanoparticles form in the environment? Well, these nanoscale materials will form as, a, as intermediates of precipitation and dissolution reactions that are occurring constantly in a sediment environment. And uh, for mercury, what that means is that when you have mercury in sediments, the, the driving force for mercury sulfide precipitation is constantly there. So, and then that means you can have nanoscale materials of mercury sulfides forming and con constantly forming and, and associating. Here I'm showing this figure showing how that process might happen and how organic matter could influence the formation or at least influence this process of mercury sulfide precipitation. So imagine you have dissolved complexes of mercury that are starting to precipitate with sulfides. The organic matter can interfere with this process by coating the initial uh, polynuclear clusters that form, as well as start coat amor the amorphous nanoscale mercury sulfide particles that are uh, the, that are the nucleation products of of, uh, of mineral sulfide precipitation. These amorphous particles would ripen over time, as well as aggregate, and organic matter would be coating these particles uh, during this whole process. And this process going from the top to the bottom, I kind of see it as an aging process for mercury sulfides, in which every step the mercury has different uh, potentials for re-dissolving back into the pore water. And so you have all of these processes occurring at the same time, in which the, the extent of each process is limited by the rate as opposed to reactions at equilibrium. And so some subset of this mercury will be able to dissolve before it's taken up by uh, microorganisms that then can methylate the mercury. <coughs> so in the next slide, I'm showing you some lab experiments where we demonstrate how organic matter actually will slow the process of mercury sulfide precipitation. So here's a graph where, or here's an experiment where we took dissolved mercury and dissolved sulfide, 
and precipitated it in solution that contained the humic acid. And the graph here is showing the hydrodynamic diameter of particles uh, measured as a function of the precipitation time. And what you can see is that as we increase the amount of humic acid in solution, we end up getting smaller particles that grow more that are that grow slowly, more slowly over time with increasing humic concentration. And with enough humic acid, you get particles in terms of the hydrogen di diameter that are very small, less than 100 nanometers in diameter, and stable in solution. The kinds of particles that you're forming are actually aggregates of very small nanoparticles. So this is a t TM image of one of the solutions I showed on the previous graph. Uh, the image basically shows uh, fairly amorphous nanoparticles of about 5 nanometers in diameter, and they are aggregated. So uh, I guess the take home there is that in a sediment environment, the mercury speciation is controlled by uh, kinetically limited precipitation dissolution reactions of mercury sulfide. And so you have a mixture of mercury sulfide species that would include nanoscale particles as well as microcrystalline particles. So then the second question is, of this collection of mercury sulfides that would exist in sediments, what, which proportion, which, what portion of those, which species of, those, of that mercury are available to uh, methylating microorganisms. And so uh, this is where the, the meat of our research really focused on this, this area. And we had performed a lot of experiments uh, with micro, methylating microorganisms where we basically compared the dissolution potential of dissolved mercury versus nanoparticulate mercury versus microparticulate or microcrystalline mercury. So let me give you an outline of the basic uh, the basic design of, mo of most of the experiments that we perform. Um, so here, the, the objective here was to link mercury methylation potential, or bioavailability, to the age of mercury sulfides and sediments. And what I mean by age is that we're comparing dissolved mercury versus nanoparticles versus microscale particles. And so the way we did this experiment was that we cultured uh, methylating bacteria, uh, a sulfate-reducing bacteria, um, that was actually grown fermentatively. And we exposed to one of these three forms of mercury, um, dissolved, nanoparticulate, or microcrystalline metacinnabar, um, all at the same mercury concentration. And we were hypothesizing that the production of methylmercury will decrease as you go from the top to the bottom, as you go to uh, longer aging states of mercuric sulfides. So our initial set of experiments tested this with a pure culture. And then later on, I'll show you results where we did the same experiment, but in the sediment microcosm setting. OK, so here's the result of the pure culture experiment. Uh, again, we have our fermentatively grown uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria that can methylate mercury. And we expose it to either dissolved mercury, nanoparticulate, or bulk scale particulate. And what you can see is that we have the greatest amount of methylmercury produced over time with the dissolved treatment, uh, an intermediate amount of mercury produced with the nanoparticle treatment, and then hardly any methylmercury produced with the bulk scale metacinnabar, uh, not, very, uh, not significantly different from our abiotic controls. Um, so, the, so there's a definitely a gradient in methylation potential, depending on what kind of mercuric sulfide you're dealing with. And then the other thing that is, uh, I guess, unique about this result is that we have much greater methylmercury produced with the nanoparticles compared to the microscale particles. Uh, and that's a result that would not have been predicted by a chemical equilibrium approach, which would have said that the, ac the uh, activity of these, regardless if it's nanocrystalline or not, would, would, not, would have been the same. And, it w and equilibrium would not have predicted uh, this result. Um, so this is an experiment where we have the same amount of mercury added, but different forms. Um, you could argue that, well, the nanoparticles are smaller, and they just have more surface area to release dissolved mercury compared to the big particles. So we redid this experiment uh, where instead of normalizing to the same mercury concentration, we normalized it, or we tried to normalize it to the same surface area of particles. So here we have 
nanoscale mercury sulfide at one nanomolar, and that amount of surface area dissolved in the uh, added to the culture media. And we have bulk scale mercury sulfide added at two different concentrations, but similar surface area relative to the nanoparticles. And we can see that even when you try to normalize it to the nan to surface area, the nanoparticles have an enhanced bioavailability. There's more methylmercury produced here for the nanoparticles as compared to the bulk scale particles. Um, so this is, these are experiments comparing nano versus bulk scale. But now I want to show you results where we're actually comparing multiple types of nanoparticles. So in this case, we took this is the same pure culture experiment with the methylene bacteria. But we took uh, our nanoparticles, uh, the stocks, and, and aged the stock solutions of the nanoparticles for multiple, day, uh, for multiple days. So going from less than a half hour to up to one week in terms of aging time for the stock solutions. And uh, we aged it for various times before we gave it to the microorganisms that produce methylmercury. And so what we can see here is methylmercury produced as a function of time, incubation time, for the different aging states of nanoparticles. And you can see that the, uh, the youngest particles, the ones that are freshly precipitated, are, have the greatest methylation potential. We see the most amount of methylmercury produced by those organisms that get the youngest nanoparticles. And then with age of the nanoparticles, we see a decrease in its methylation potential. <coughs> so then, uh, this is showing how there's different aging states of nanoparticles. And we, you, you can't account for this difference based off of the dissolution of mercury in, in the bulk water, or at least the quantification of dissolved, uh, dissolved mercury. So this graph is showing dissolved mercury uh, for different types of nanoscale mercury added to uh, the culture media. And the graph on the left is the same graph I showed before, methylmercury concentration as a function of incubation time for the different aging states. This is just dissolved mercury that was quantified when one of these forms of nanoscale mercury sulfide was added to culture media that didn't have any bacteria. So we don't have methylmercury being produced here. And what you can see is that, well, so the youngest particle uh, in the red dots, that's less than 0.2 hours old, um, has a greater amount of dissolved mercury over time. But when you compare the other time points from one day, 24 hours to 192 hours, we don't see much difference between dissolved mercury, even though there's a difference in the methylation potential uh, for these. And the dissolved mercury here, I forgot to mention, was quantified by ultracentrifugation. Um, so the take home here is that the bioavailability of, of the different forms of nanoscale mercury uh, doesn't correlate with the dissolution of mercury into bulk solution. Uh, but we did see that it seemed to correlate with the actual structural uh, characteristics of the nanoscale mercury. So this is uh, X-ray absorption, uh, extended X-ray absorption fine structure spectroscopy data where we're using this method to look at the uh, local coordination environment of mercury in these mercury sulfide nanoparticles. So uh, the graph on the left is showing the absorption signal as a function of the X-ray energy or wave number. And these oscillations are due to the uh, uh, emitted, uh, the absorbed radiation interacting with the atoms that neighbor the mercury atoms in, this, in these mercury sulfide nanoparticles. You can take these oscillations, perform a Fourier transform, and you can get a radial distribution function of the mercury atoms and its, of mercury and its surrounding atoms in the mercury sulfide structure. So for example, on the top two, I have the spectra, or at least the radial distribution function that you'd see for two types of uh, mercury sulfide crystals. Uh, metacinnabar and cinnabar. And these peaks correspond to atoms that are surround the, the, the closest neighboring atoms surrounding the mercury atoms in, in, the, in the crystal structure. So in this case is the sulfur atom that's neighboring the mercury atom. Uh, and then the second one here is the, is the uh, second shell mercury-mercury uh, uh, interaction. Um, the height of these peaks, or you can, you can apply models to these uh, to these spectra, where then 
as an outcome of the model, you can figure out the coordination number of the structure as well as the bond distance and also the, cr the crystallinity of, of, the, uh, of, of the particles that, that you're uh, measuring. So the bottom four spectra show the four different nanoparticles of mercury sulfide nanoparticles of the four different aging states. And through first shell fitting, or at least modeling of the first shell of this data, we find that the particles actually all have the same coordination number, which also means that they have the same diameter, monomer diameter. But uh, their crystallinity, as uh, shown by the sigma squared, is changing with time. So sigma squared is also known as the, as the structural disorder. So for a higher sigma squared, you have more disorder, or at least a more amorphous uh, crystal structure. So what's happening here as particles age not, is not necessarily that their uh, diameter is changing, but the, the structural disorder is changing. So with precipitation time, what we see is that the structural disorder in red is decreasing. So in other words, the, 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 right, the crystals are ripening to more ordered structures. And we can see that the bond distance for this first mercury sulfur bond is increasing and approaching, uh, approaching the bond distance that you'd expect for crystalline metacinnabar. Right. So this decrease is also, or this change in structural disorder is also correlating with um, the uh, methylation potential of mercury uh, that we observe. Um, so the take home here is that there's no single type of nanoscale mercury sulfide. And it doesn't have a single bioavailability because there's, it depends on the crystal structure, the aging state, and, and the degree of ag aggregation. And as nanoscale mercury sulfides age with time, they'll tend to aggregate and also ripen. Uh, the, the crystal structures will ripen. And that influences their bioavailability. So next I want to talk about um, some experiments we did with um, sediment slurries. Um, here we took sediments from the San Francisco Bay Delta region um, where we were looking at how this uh, gradient in mercury methylation potential might uh, change as a function of the salinity of the water. So here uh, we have microcosms that were, uh, where sediments were taken from a saline portion of the San Francisco Bay and also sediments from a more freshwater portion of the San Francisco Bay. And we incubated these sediments in, an, uh, in a batch reactor uh, under anaerobic conditions and added one of the three forms of mercury, dissolved nanoparticulate or microparticulate mercury sulfides, uh, to these microcosms and then monitored the production of methylmercury. So this graph here is showing um, the microcosm with the saline or brackish water um, sediment. Uh, its salinity is very close to seawater, so you can see from the sulfate concentration. And what we observed in terms of methylmercury production was very similar, a very similar result as our pure culture studies. So we see the greatest amount of methylmercury produced in those cultures or microcosms that get dissolved mercury, an intermediate amount of mercury in those uh, microcosms getting nanoparticles, and then very little mercury, methylmercury produced uh, in the microcosms getting microscale particles. And so this is a result that uh, is similar to the pure cultures. Um, but when we did this in the, a freshwater microcosm, we don't get the same result. So this is a sediment, freshwater sediment taken from closer to the delta part of the San Francisco Bay Area, um, where you know, the sulfate concentrations are uh, much lower. And what we see is an equal amount of methylmercury produced in those microcosms that get dissolved and nanoparticulate, dissolved or nanoparticulate mercury. Um, and there's no, uh, no difference between the dissolved and the nano. Um, you also notice that the absolute amounts of methylmercury produced here on the right is less than the amount produced on the left. Okay. But what we think is going on between this freshwater and saline water is that you have different things that are controlling methylmercury production in these microcosms. On the left, you have methylation that's limited by the bioavailability of the mercury, and hence you get the differentiation between dissolved and nanoparticles. 
on the right, what we see is no differentiation between dissolved and nanoparticles, but uh, also a lower sulfate concentration, which we think that it means that this, this microcosm, the, the methylmercury production is limited by the productivity of the organisms that produce methylmercury. And these organisms, as I mentioned before, are anaerobic organisms, uh, including sulfate reducers. So here with the lower sulfate, we might, we probably have what I call uh, microbial productivity lim limited methylation. Okay, so let me summarize all of these experimental results that we have so far and uh, kind of put them in context, or at least put them, uh, summarize them in points that sort of bring it all together. Um, first is that in sediments, um, we've demonstrated that mercury will, mercury sulfides will uh, comprise a mixture of nanoscale and microcrystalline species, and organic matter plays an important role in controlling the dynamics of the mercury sulfide formation. <laughs> the second point is that the, um, these have a spectrum, these different mercury sulfides have a spectrum of bioavailability. And the reactivity actually probably depends on its interaction with the microorganisms themselves. So I call it chemical reactivity at, uh, at cell interfaces. We've also demonstrated that measurements of dissolved mercury in um, bulk pore water, or at least dissolved mercury in bulk pore water tends to be very low, a very low proportion of the total mercury. And also that it's just not a good indicator of bioavailability, or at least uh, methylation potential. And this last point is, comes from our sediment microcosm experiment where we show that methylmercury production can be controlled by the bioavailability of the mercury, so the chemistry of the mercury, and it could be controlled by simply by the activity of the methylating organism. And there's a balance to be played here where one might be more important than the other in controlling methylmercury production. So let me get to the last part. This would be kind of like our transition plan, in, in a way, of uh, how what we're thinking, how this can be used, all of this information can be used to better manage contaminated sediments. So let me think of it, let me talk about it first from a kind of a watershed management perspective. Um, so when we have to think about mercury contamination on a watershed scale, we have to think about, we have to remember that there's actually could be multiple sources of mercury to the sediments, including coming mercury coming from atmospheric deposition, mercury that might be mobilized as colloids from upland soil, and then mercury that might be just in the sediments from a legacy contamination scenario, so historical contamination where that mercury has gone through many decades of weathering. And these various sources of mercury all contribute mercury of of different forms. Uh, dissolved mercury coming from atmospheric deposition, uh, nanoscale or colloidal mercury coming from uh, par particles that are mobilized from, from the upland areas, or microcrystalline mercury that had been uh, basically weathered over many, many decades. And the implications of, result, of our results say that all of these different forms have a spectrum of bioavailability, from high bioavailability and methylation potential for the most dissolved species to a low bioavailability and methylation potential for the most crystalline species. And so from a management perspective, while you might be concerned about a historical contamination scenario that has the most amount of total mercury, this kind of mercury has probably the lowest of bioavailability or methylation potential. And atmospheric deposition, which might not be as much of a, a large contributor in terms of the total mass of mercury, it might be a large contributor in terms of the methylation potential. So the key is to try to balance these different uh, sources. Uh, our research has also led us to think more uh, closely about how we use this information to improve methods for monitoring in the environment and methods that can then contribute to decisions for remediation. And so monitoring, in terms of monitoring, the what I, what I see is the, the questions that we want to try to answer is, you know, what fraction of the mercury in sediments is actually available to methylating bacteria? In other words, what is the methylation potential of the mercury that are in, in contaminated sediments? 
So a good ex uh, a place where is, is a good example of where we want to try to answer this question is a place in the South River in in Virginia, where in this area uh, mercury bioaccumulation in fish is is a great concern, and there is a historical point source of mercury to this river, uh, a um, a textile factory uh, that is. Uh, in Waynesboro, Virginia, had uh, released a decent amount of mercury in the uh, upland uh, regions uh, for this river. And you can see the little droplets of elemental mercury in, in upland soils to this river. And this provides a large source of total mercury to this river, but the question is what fraction of that mercury is actually available to, for methylation, for methylmercury production? So to answer this question, I, I kind of view this as a two-part question in terms of how do you quantify mercury methylation potential. We know that there's two dominant factors that influence mercury methylation potential. One is the geochemistry of the mercury, what the proportion of mercury that's available, bioavailable to bacteria. The second part is the actual microorganisms that methylate mercury and their activity. So let me first talk about the first part, the geochemistry of the mercury and its bioavailability and how we might quantify, quantify that in sediments, um, as, as our research might tell us. Okay, so here's um, a result from our experiments with the nanoparticles, uh, where we're comparing nanoparticles and microscale particles, where we were not only interested in their methylation potential, which I showed that the nanoparticles are greater in methylation potential relative to the microscale particles, but we were also interested uh, in differentiating between their reactivity, particularly a reactivity with a thiol compound like glutathione. So um, the general, uh, the, I guess the, what researchers believe is the part of the, contributes to the mechanism of uptake in, act, in microorganisms is that mercury binds to some kind of thiol or sulfhydryl containing compound before it is taken up by the organism. So if you look at the reactivity of nanoscale mercury with a thiol like glutathione compared to microscale mercury sulfide, you can see that the nanoparticles are dissolved much more quickly with the glutathione relative to the microscale particles. So the nanoscale particles are much more reactive with the glutathione. And so this led us to think that perhaps we can take this information and basically develop what I call a thiol-based probe that you can use to quantify bioavailable mercury concentration in sediments. So for example, we could use a thiol, like a selective extraction protocol, a uh, where we quantify thiol extractable mercury. Um, so here's the, re the result I showed before of our pure cultures exposed to one of the three different forms of mercury, and we get three different levels of methylmercury production. Well, the uh, if you were to look at the thiol extractable mercury at the final time point of these culture experiments, what we found was that the percent of the mercury that was extractable by thiols was actually correlated with the amount of methylmercury that was in solution. And so, and you know, we didn't see this kind of correlation with, with, by simply looking at the dissolved mercury. We looked at what was thiol extractable. And so this, this might lead us to uh, kind of like a a, a protocol that would, uh, that would look at the bioavailable fraction based off its reactivity with thiols. Um, another similar approach uh, that could be taken is uh, using in situ passive samplers, uh, such as diffusive gradient and thin film samplers, also known as DGT samplers. These are also thiol-based samplers for, for mercury. Um, where if you're not familiar with these, these are basically samplers where you have a plastic housing and inside this housing you have a thiolated silica resin layer that acts as a sink for dissolved mercury. This resin, resin layer is overlaid with an, an agarose diffusion layer and then a 0.45 micron membrane filter. And it makes a sandwich where then this all compresses into this, uh, into this sampler here. Um, you, and then you deploy this in either the water or, or sediments, the water column or sediments. And what happens is that the mer mercury, um, dissolved phase of the mercury, um, penetrates from the top of the filter, diffuses through the diffusion layer, and then binds to the thiolated resin layer, which acts like a perfect sink for mercury. Right? 
So the way people have deployed these passive samplers is assuming that um, the uptake of mercury or metal on these DGT samplers occurs through fixed law for, for diffusive uptake. So assuming that you have only dissolved species. And so this, this is what this equation is, is that the accumulated mass of mercury divided by the dissolved concentration in bulk pore water is equal to a diffusion coefficient D, as well as a factor cor uh, uh, correcting for the geometry of the sampler and then multiplied by time. And so uh, you can quantify, uh, the, if you can quantify the mass of mercury on a sampler and you know the diffusion coefficient, you can calculate the dissolved fraction, the dissolved concentration in bulk pore water. So that's how these samplers are used. And what I have on the bottom here are graphs where we've taken these samplers and exposed it to aqueous solutions of dissolved mercury. And we show that it does, it does seem to follow this fixed law equation. So we have the amount of mercury accumulated on the resin divided by what's dissolved in solution. And you can see that this uptake is linear with time, um, where the slope of this is equal or is proportional to the diffusion coefficient. Uh, so on the left is a solution with just dissolved mercury, uh, so mercury as a mercury hydroxide complex. On the right, we also have humic acid, so this mercury would be complexed by humic acid. And we also see a linear uptake in which the slope of this relationship is smaller than on the left, and that could be explained by a slow, smaller diffusion coefficient of mercury organic matter complexes in this resin layer relative to mercury hydroxide complexes. So this is, seems to work when you have only dissolved species of mercury uh, in solution. But I want to say that if you have a mixture of dissolved and nanoparticulate phases, these samplers don't, don't work as they are intended to work. So here I have, I'm showing results of two different experiments on the left and on the right, where we expose these samplers to solutions that comprise a mixture of dissolved and nanoparticulate mercury. Uh, so here on the top is the graph of the mercury concentration, the total concentration, and what falls through a 0.02 micron filter. So we have a 10, nanome 10 nanomolar of mercury sulfide nanoparticles spiked in here. A, pro a proportion of it uh, dissolves. And then on the bottom, I'm showing that accumulation on the filter as a function of time. And this was done two times, um, shown on the left and the right. And basically the take home here is that the uptake on these samplers, if it really was just taking up dissolved mercury, it should be a linear trend. But we don't have a linear trend here, or at least one that can be reproducible. And the, what's happening here is that the nanoparticles are somehow interfering with the uptake of dissolved mercury on these samplers, the uptake rate of the dissolved mercury. Um, so our take home here is that you, know, you, can't use these poor, you can't use these poor water samplers as measures of truly dissolved mercury. But you might be able to use them as a measure of bioavailability if you look at the uptake kinetics, or at least how, how the uptake of mercury on these, on these uh, DGT samplers changes with time. Because uh, that, that, uh, that might be an indicator of bioavailability itself. So this is an area in which we're uh, exploring uh, further. Uh, and um, we're doing a lot of things in the lab, but we, we certainly are looking for partners uh, in the field to, to help us with this. Um, so uh, coming back to this question of mercury methylation potential, um, so I talked about how we might quantify mercury bioavailability um, using thiol-based um, uh, thiol protocols. On the right, I want to talk about the other factor that's just as important in terms of contributing to mercury methylation potential, and that's the look, looking at the organisms themselves and how to quantify their activity. So this is an area that, um, in which there's actually been a lot of um, progress in the last couple of years in terms of helping us figure out who are the microorganisms that methylate mercury and how might we quantify their activity. So this, um, this progress is basically tied to the discovery of a couple genes that are actually required for methylmercury production, uh, the HDCA and HDCB genes. Um, these are, organ these are genes in which HCCA is the protein, uh, encodes for a coronoid protein that transfers a methyl group to the mercury. 
And the other protein, HCCB, basically converts this HCCA protein back into a form where it can accept another methyl donor uh, to convert it to methylmercury. And so organisms that can produce methylmercury need both of these genes to produce both of these proteins. And so people have, uh, other people, not our group, but other people have looked at the prevalence of these genes in different kinds of microorganisms. And we've come to realize that there's a wide diversity of microorganisms that can produce methylmercury. They're all anaerobes, but they include sulfate reducers, iron reducers, uh, syntrophs with uh, sulfate and iron reducers, as well as archaea bac bacteria, uh, archaea uh, organisms such as methanogens. And so with this sort of breakthrough, what we need in terms of the challenge is a genetic or functional biomarker that can include all of these organisms um, and then we can then also correlate it to methylmercury production. And this can get us to that last, the second part of quantifying the activity of the microorganisms. So in terms of uh, how we can quantify mercury methylation potential, this is how I envision of how we can put it all together. You can take these measurements of uh, mercury bioavailability as well as um, gene abundance or gene expression and develop these uh, response plots as they, how these two factors influence net methylmercury production rate. So gene abundance or expression, bioavailability. And by developing plots like this, you can use this combined with um, measurements performed in the field to figure out at the, at the field site where you are on this plot and then also use this information to figure out what kinds of remediation strategies are, are, uh, are optimal for reducing, uh, where you are, reducing the methylmercury production rate on this graph. So whether you, uh, the remediation should go after decreasing the bioavailability of mercury or decreasing the activity of the organism. So let me just summarize everything that uh, this pro uh, what this project has uh, come up with in terms of results. We've uh, found that there are many chemical forms of mercury, um, mercury sulfides and sediments, and most of this mercury is actually bound to particles. That include nanoscale uh, mercury sulfides. And these, this collection of particles will have a spectrum of bioavailability in which the, uh, the, the reactivity of the mercury sulfides depends on its aging state and it's, uh, probably its interactions with microorganisms and that you can't simply use dissolved mercury concentration in pore water as a, as a measure of bioavailability. So these results in terms of implications means that for risk assessments, you have to consider multiple sources of mercury with variable aging states. And it also helps us uh, finalize at least the, uh, the develop measurement, tool, measurement tools for bioavailability. And I wanna emphasize that these tools need to be biologically relevant. So I'll just end the presentation with a list of the papers that have been published so far from this work. And um, I believe I will have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, we have time for some questions. If anyone would like to ask any? Yeah, this is Marvin Unger from um, CERTA PSTCP. Helen, great presentation, very informative. Uh, in, in the world of, of sediment remediation, um, there are two basic uh, approaches, and one is let's dredge it and get it out of there, or let's cap it because we don't want to cause any further problems and let's leave it in place. Has there been any work on the, the reversibility um, of some of these reactions, in particular, I guess, some of the, um, the more stabilized forms? Uh, how... how um, uh, how easy it is it? How easy is it for them uh, those types of stabilized forms to go back into the dissolved phase? And um, I guess for your basic gut feeling, uh, what is the um, the implications of disturbing a sediment area uh, that has reasonably high um, uh, levels of mercury? Um, yeah. So to answer your first question, the reversibility of this aging process that I was talking about. Um, so I guess you mean the reversibility of mercury sulfides particles precipitating. Um, there has been some work looking at how different like changes in 
solution conditions will, will enhance the solubility of particles. And I think the presence of organic matter is probably one of the big factors. So if you have a huge increase in dissolved organic carbon, that can actually enhance the solubility of you know, crystalline mercury sulfides. Um, so I can see this scenario where if you had a change in the ecosystem in which you get an influx of organic carbon, that might change, that'll change things. Um, the other question relates to what my thoughts are on, on dredging. Um, dredge, dredging is tricky. Uh, it's the idea of just digging it up and getting rid of it is, is very enticing, but in the process of it, you end up resuspending a lot of particles and perhaps moving, moving sediment particles further downstream, and so broadening the area in which you then have to worry about. Um, and certainly roiling the any organic matter which may be on the surface. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, as I understand it, it it's, I see it as war being warranted for the really high levels of contamination. And what I mean by that is, like, areas near mercury mines, where you have tens to hundreds of parts per million of mercury in sediments. And, and um, yeah, and those are kind of unique scenarios, but in a, in a lot of so-called contaminated sediment environments, you actually have a lot less mercury than that. You might have like a part per million or less, but yet it might be an issue because you have uh, you've observed um, elevated mercury in the in the fish in the in the biota, and so there's some, something going on with that ecosystem. So I I don't think it's a catch-all uh, solution, um, and I I've seen I mean in my mind it, maybe it's okay for for the really really contaminated scenarios, but for the others. I get the sense that it's not the way to go. Thank you, Helen. Any other questions? Yeah, this is Ellen Brown, um, the RPM for um, the Bremerton um, Sinclair Inlet site where we have the kind of mercury levels that um, you were just referring to, Helen, just um, fairly low levels, but we see it in some species. And one of the things we're looking at um, is an, uh, a cap that would have activated carbon. And I'm wondering what you think about the potential for, um, you know, would that have any detrimental effects in the way of adding organic carbon to the system? Yeah, um, well, yeah, this is certainly an area that I'm very much interested in, in terms of follow-up. Um, I guess activated carbon itself is not seen as a stimulant for biological productivity, because it's generally not a, an available source of carbon for them. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying to search through the literature to see if I can find people demonstrating this. Um, so I think as absorbent for mercury, I think it's a good choice. I don't know if it's, maybe the cost might be high, but in terms of the technical fields and technical aspects, of it, I, can see, I can see it as being a good choice. Um, but I think it, it's only going to be certain kinds of scenarios in which something like that, like an approach like that would work. Um, it would be scenarios where, um, you know, if you were to change the bioavailability of mercury, you would actually get an effect in terms of um, changing its, the production of methylmercury. And this is, goes, kind of goes back to my presentation where I was kind of discussing, let me go back a slide, this balance between mercury bioavailability and mercury and then the activity of the organism. So if you had a site where the bioavailability was actually really quite low, but the, um, but you know, so methylmercury is really produced or at least controlled, um, the methylmercury production is really just pretty much controlled by the activity of the organism. Any further changes or reductions in bioavailability will give you marginal effects in terms of the net methylmercury production. And really where you can get more bang for your buck is to try to somehow reduce the activity of the organism. So I, I can see that would be the kind of scenario where I can see uh, something like a activated carbon-based approach might not work. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? 
Thank you, Helen. I'd like, I really do appreciate you taking the time to prepare and provide the presentation. It is very helpful to us at the program office. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.